Hey, Al. Hey, Barry. What's the difference between a wizard and a sorcerer? What? Class. It's time for a compelled duel. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Capel Duel. I'm Barry. And I'm Al. And we are a single-player, co-DM'd D&D 5th Edition actual play podcast. Previously on Compelled Duel. I hate Oskaya so much. Magic cats? Magic cats. This cat gets him at the bottom of the jaw as he gets up to try to get to you and just rakes a claw up and across his face, almost takes a fucking eye out, and he just falls to the floor. Fee, standing on its back, trying to, like, balance like a surfboarder, is just gonna drop both hands down into its shoulder blades and cast the Shocking Grasp. What happened? We killed the cat, if that was not self-evident. Is that proof enough for you? And here we have the winners of this year's games. By deed, I name you Leorel who rode the crack cat. By deed, I name you Ferora who brings thunder upon her enemies. The favor we would ask is passage on your ship to Candlelight Wharf. You do notice at one point a group of five Stormfolk walk in. This is a gift from the gentleman at the next table over. You look down at the business card in front of you, and it identifies him as one Ernest Hammerbrook. You feel digging in past the boning of your corset, the point of a very sharp knife at your back. (laughs) Now, Mr. Hammerbrook, I thought we were having too nice of a conversation. I'd apologize for the deception, but it strikes me that I never actually told you my name was Ernest Hammerbrook. And, <laughs> to be fair to him, he hasn't used his identity much since I killed him. Most folks just call me the Captain. I'm the Pirate King of the Zephyr Isles. And you'll be coming with us. So we pick up a couple of days after we last left off. Leo, you and Fee have been thrown into the brig of a massive, multiple-masted, multiple-decked sailing ship. And mostly left to your own devices. You've been given food and water at regular intervals, but nobody's said much to you. Leo has been stewing quietly throughout this whole journey when he's not being violently seasick. Fee has been clawing at the walls. Like, (laughs) Fee is pacing. Fee is quite annoyed. As she is pacing, Leo glares at her and says, And this is why we are taught not to talk to strangers, right? Have we learned this lesson? Oh, I don't want to hear anything about my decision-making from you. One time I cut loose. (laughs) Just the once. (laughs) And the one time you cut loose, we get kidnapped. Uh. Yeah, you know what? Actually, I'm done. I don't have anything more to say. And then Leo sits down in the corner very quietly. She makes a frustrated noise and just goes back to pacing. There's a bit of a lull. And then in walks someone you have not seen before so far. A, uh. Pretty round, stormfolk dude, curly dark hair pulled back into a ponytail, a magnificent ascot (laughs) tied around his neck. (laughs) Looks a little nervous. He's holding a garment bag in one hand, and he presses the other over his chest as he does a short bow. And then he looks at Fee and says, The captain requests your company for dinner. Oh, fantastic! We would love dinner, given that we've only been given bread and water for the past couple days. This guy looks at you, and then tilts his head a little bit and says, Not you. 
Her. Mm hmm. Leo's not blaming Fee at this point, but he does shoot her a pretty venomous glare. You can tell the captain, whatever his name is, that I wholeheartedly decline. And the Stormfolk dude says, I'm afraid that isn't going to be an option for you, ma'am. And then he, like, jiggles the garment bag a little bit, and he says, I've brought this for you to wear. And then he spreads his hands, kind of like, what are you gonna do? And says, I suppose you don't have to come, but... Well, I'll put it this way. Talking with the captain is the only way that the two of you are getting out of the cell anytime soon. So, and then he passes the garment bag through the bars and he says, I'll give you time to change and think it over. Leo waits for this random dude that has just come down there to turn around and then turns over to Fee and goes, put on the fucking dress. It's a matter of principle. You flirted us into this mess. Now, goddammit, you are going to go up there and flirt us out. Fine. Turn around. Leo will help get her into the dress if she needs help. I think she needs a little bit of help. Very obviously, this is a dress that is not sized to her proportions, but it fits all right. It is very clearly Australian in, like, make and style, but it's, like bright red and orange and swishier than how Fee tends to dress. Okay, yeah, I'll help her into it however she needs. Fee, after you are dressed, you follow this very well-dressed Stormfolk young man out of the brig. As you walk away, you see Leo's hand point out through the bars at you, and you hear him yell, If you abandon me down here, my revenge will be swift and terrible. Over her shoulder, feet through gritted teeth, says, Noted! You follow this young Stormfolk man up a very steep, narrow set of stairs from the brig up to the deck of this ship. You are out on the open ocean in the dark of the night. You can see nothing around you other than rolling glassy waters, and a bright sky full of stars overhead. He leads you across the deck to a set of misty glass windows with a low warm light glowing inside, knocks on the door briefly, opens it, and then gives you a short bow and gestures you inside. Fee bobs a little curtsy to him and then goes inside. You enter into a very richly appointed captain's quarters. It is larger than what Katya's was on her boat by quite a bit. In one corner, there is a large table with a lot of maps spread out across it and navigator's tools. There's a desk in another corner that is laden down with several letters, it looks like, and against the opposite wall with a couple of portholes looking out over the ocean, there is a massive four-poster bed draped with colorful scarves in dark reds and oranges and yellows just kind of sitting there. But what you notice first is that in the middle of the room, there is a small dining table where the captain, as he introduced himself, is sitting with his boots kicked up on the table. He has ditched the rich brocade frock coat that he had on when you first met him. That is hanging on a hall tree right next to the door. He still has on the loose linen shirt that is open all the way to the waistband of his pants. And he still has on the beat-up tricorn hat. He shoots you a lopsided, sharp-toothed grin from across the room and says, Ah, good to see that the dress fit you as well as it does. We weren't prepared for company of quite such a caliber. Do have a seat. Would you like to do anything as you move into this room? Do I have my wand or my orb on me? No, all of your feasible weapons were taken from you and Leo before you got on the ship. So Leo doesn't have his armor, you don't have your mage's armor, you don't have your wand, there's nothing that you could use as a weapon on you. Can I look at the maps over on the table? Yeah, sure, make me an investigation check. 
That's a 16. Also, that brings up an interesting question. Do I have the cape on me? No, the cape was absolutely confiscated from you as soon as you got on the boat. Fun. Okay. With the 16, as you're looking down at this spread of maps, you can see very clearly that you are sailing through the Zephyr Isles. That is what most of the maps there are outlining. The one on top of the table has a very detailed map of an area that is known as the Dragon's Maw that connects the southern coast of Australia with Pearlport in the Zephyr Isles and the coast of Dowrier. And there are a lot of red X's with dates marked next to them on the map. There's no real way to tell where you are right now, but it seems like wherever this vessel is headed, that's its general orbit. Okay. With that information gleaned, I'm going to take a seat. As you sit down, the captain takes his feet down off the top of the table. Well, the first thing you need to understand, lass, is that no harm is going to come to you aboard my ship. We have quite a strict policy here in the Zephyr Isles of taking good care of any prisoners we may take. The second thing is, I'm sure you'll understand that we're in a bit of an unprecedented circumstance here, I. She kind of settles back in her chair, crosses her arms over her chest, and says, I don't follow. You will soon enough. At that point, the door to the captain's quarters swings open, and the absolutely massive Stormfolk dude with the blonde buzz cut that you saw in the bar walks in with silver-domed trays lined up each arm. He sets all of this down and undomes it in quick succession and says, Dinner tonight consists of my famous spinach puffs, followed by... An arugula salad with a delicate raspberry balsamic glaze, a duck confit for the main course, and a citrus sorbet for dessert. The captain nods and says, Thank you, Boots. That'll be all. And the big dude just bows out of the room after leaving the food behind him. Fee pauses and then says, Boots? The captain, already biting into a spinach puff, says, Well, you see, the thing is, there are a certain amount of folks in the Zephyr Isles that, um, names are a little bit difficult for us. You understand? Well, you don't understand. But Boots was one of the first people that enlisted on the ship, and I wasn't great at assigning names at that point. Uh-huh. Oh, so you named him Boots. You did that to him. He's all right with it. Most of them are. But that's not what we're here to discuss, is it? Fact of the matter is, I have a gift for you. A gift? Of a sort. How gracious of you after locking me in a cell for two days. The captain reaches under the table and pulls up a lovingly cleaned and folded gift of the Stormbringer and places it on the table in front of you. And Leo, back in the cell in the brig, there is a young Stormfolk woman, short, dark hair, pretty solidly built, sitting on a backwards chair in front of the door to your cell, just whittling a piece of ivory with a knife. Leo is walking up and down the cell with a tin cup, just rattling it along the bars. This young Stormfolk woman says, You mind cutting the rocket? Roll me inside really quick. 19. It dawns on you as she's talking that this is a teenager. She looks a little bit older than you think she is. She has very, like, angular, very cut features. But the bitchy look that she's giving you can only be that of a teenage girl. Leo narrows his eyes and then decides to play this situation out to his maximum benefit and goes, Hey, kid, what's your name? She stops what she's doing, looks at you and says, One, don't call me kid. And two, it's you. Your name is Leoril? 
she sighs. <laughs> Every fucking time. No, my name is you. You. Okay, that's wonderful. So tell me, uh, you. Do you really think I deserve to be locked up in here? I mean, how big of a threat am I? I'm just a little guy. Right? <laughs> she snorts. I'm shorter than you are, and I've taken mm, eight trained sailors in combat at once. Yeah, but I mean, look at me, and Leo flexes his atrophied arms. You know, but I could use, I could use some fresh air. You could help me out with that, right? You? I feel like we have an understanding. She gets up from the chair, arms crossed over her chest, and like leans into the bars and says, You and I don't have an understanding about shit. It is my opinion that the captain, for everything else that he is, is an admirable pirate, and he's got good instincts when it comes to people that he judges to be threats. Ah, pirates. Good to know. Leo goes back to walking up and down the cell and rattling the tin cup along the bars again. She's going to try and snatch the tin cup out of your hand. <laughs> We're going to roll uh, strength versus dex. That's a dirty 20 for Leo. That's a nat 20 for you. <laughs> okay, he tries to snatch it back from her and she just wrestles it out of his grip, I guess. She nods in satisfaction, raises the mug as if to toast you and says, We're taking this. Fee, you are still sitting in the captain's quarters. He is holding a lovingly folded and cleaned gift of the Stormbringer right in front of you on the table. What do you do? I'm not trying to be rude, but I am going to try and snatch it. Okay, we're going to roll a dex contest. 13. <laughs> and the captain rolled an 18. So you go to grab for the cape and he yanks it back very sharply. He stands up, very slowly walks behind you and drapes the cape over your shoulders, buckles it into place in front of your neck, and then moves back around the table to sit back in his seat. But before he fully sits back down, he reaches under the collar of the cape where the bright silvery scale mail is and runs two fingers down along the hem of the shifting, stormy fabric. You don't know what this is, do you, lass? Not really. I could tell you, if you'd allow it. The pauses, looks at her teeth for a second, and then says, I'm sure you'd love to think you have a lot to teach me. <laughs> Wouldn't dream of it, lass. I'll admit it does clash a bit with the colors of the dress, but we make do with what we have. Fee picks at the skirt of the dress and says, Not my usual style, but I appreciate the effort. And then she lifts a little bit of the fabric to gesture with it and says, I've noticed the Shrarian. Dare I ask how it came into your possession? He raises an eyebrow and tilts his head. The low lantern light of the captain's quarters reflects off of the obalescence, flashing the deep reds and golds in his hair and the pinks and greens in his freckles. And he says, You'd be a fool to assume that you're the first Australian last we've had on this old tub. That dress taught me two lessons. The first is never trust an Australian. The second is never trust a bard. He raises an eyebrow and says, I get what you mean. I did notice back in the bar that you reacted more than I expected to my chosen moniker. How do you know Sabine? Fee, there is the razor sharp edge of a cutlass leveled against your throat before you have the time to react. <laughs> No, there's no need to be hasty. 
The captain is standing up from his chair, has drawn his sword, has it pressed directly to your throat, and all of the levity has dropped from his face. He is deadly serious. She sent you, did she? I didn't say that. I'm guessing your dynamic is, uh, not friendly, then. The blade at your throat does not waver, but the captain slowly walks around the side of the table, looking you dead in the eye, and says, Sabine's my wife, and, uh, this wouldn't exactly be the first time she sent an assassin after me. Leo, there is a sound of a bell ringing up on deck, and the Stormfolk teenager that had been watching you straightens up, cracks her back, and then starts walking towards the staircase that leads back up onto the deck. Oh, oh, you! Where are you going? I thought we were having a good time. She puts a middle finger over her shoulder and says, I'm going to go eat dinner. You are going to have to deal with and then there are footsteps on the stairs and squeezing past her in the doorway is this like big beefy stormfolk guy with the close cropped blonde hair that had a knife to your throat in the alleyway when you and Fee got captured and behind him a uh almost as tall but way skinnier stormfolk man much darker in coloration with a It looks like a zombie bird (laughs) on his shoulder. And then you says, well, you'll have to deal with them. (laughs) And the big guy says, now you, I don't appreciate the implications. You says, not implying anything, Boots. And she makes gross kissy noises in the way that teenagers do. She starts to squeeze onto the stairway. And from the zombie looking bird (laughs) comes a voice just dripping with gravitas that says, Young lady, it is no one's fault that expressions of a sophisticated adult relationship disgust and alarm you so. The bird says this? Yes. Leo presses his lips together very tightly and nods in silence. You says, fuck off. Just because I don't want to sit around and watch you two make kissy faces at each other, it's not anything to do with me. Goodbye. And then she goes. Leo's eyeing the bird very suspiciously. (laughs) I think the big guy who is in front of the cell says, I I know that look. He points at you and he says, the man, not the bird. Is the one who's talking? The bird does the talking. But cannot stress enough. I've got nothing to do with the bird. Bird's got nothing to do with me. (laughs) This went to a dark place. (laughs) (laughs) Leo puts both of his hands up. Hey, man, I'm not here to judge. I'm just here to hang out while all of you guys watch me. He turns and he points to the guy with the bird and he says, (laughs) No, this always happens. Love, could you clarify? For, For me. I mean, before we... Clarify our avian proclivities or lack thereof. The big guy groans oh so loudly. (laughs) Hi, I'm Leo. Nice to meet the both of you. At least one of you formally, given that, you know, you did try to slip my throat in an alley. The big guy says, Now, lad, if I had wanted you dead, you'd be dead. And I have no doubts about that, and you have my... Respect? The big guy pinches the bridge of his nose, he says, Well, (laughs) I'm Boots. And then he gestures at the skinny guy and says, That's Pelican, my husband. Leo squints. You, Boots, and Pelican. The bird says, It is a long and storied Zephyr Isles custom. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. There's a pause. And then the bird says, Before we delve any deeper into this conversation. I must clarify. I am a bird, translating the thoughts of the man whose shoulder I sit upon. 
You know, that is so far from the weirdest thing that I have seen in the past year. Do either of you boys know how to play Three Dragon Ante? <laughs> the bird says, My good man, I must forewarn you. If you engage us in games of chance, this devilishly handsome side of beef will surely hand your rear end to you on a silver platter. I would like you to observe my current situation, the both of you. In a cell. Dirty. Stinky. Hungry. And I would like you to ask yourselves, what do I have to lose? The shirt off your back. And whatever dignity you may possess. <laughs> well, right now I've only got the shirt. Either of you boys got a deck of cards? Fee, you find yourself at the end of both a sword and a world-shaking revelation. Your wife. Interesting. As you're sitting there with this sword pressed against the base of your neck, you look down and you see that the captain is indeed wearing a wedding ring, just a simple gold band. Right around his finger. Would you believe she was single as far as I knew? He looks a little hurt, honestly. And then tips his head to the side and says, I, I suppose that should be the case. We, uh, didn't exactly part on the best of terms after she tried to rub me blind. Looking back on my conversations with her, the story, as far as I heard it, was that you marooned her on an island. So it did, and it was well-deserved. At any rate, the blade drops away from your throat, and he slides it back into its scabbard, and sits back down in his seat. I won't hold the irrefutable fact that Sabine lies against you, lass. If I did, I'd have to hold it against myself. He puts a hand up to his head and just kind of leans into it, not touching his food, and looking down at the wood of the table. Ah, <sighs> cave is thunder. What have I gotten myself into now? She brushes invisible dust off what she now recognizes as Sabine's dress, and says, <clears throat> Well, putting aside my relationship with your wife, and whoever Kiva is. The captain squints at you and tilts his head. Uh, and whoever Kiva is... Uh, 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 were you raised under a rock, class? Kiva? Tempest Master? Mother of Chaos? The Stormbringer? Ringing any bells? The what? She, like, plucks at the cape around her shoulder. The Stormbringer, you said. Well, I, I saw the cape and I thought that, uh, oh. Oh, well, you don't know shite, do you? I'm rapidly coming to that conclusion. He frowns and fiddles with one of the chains around his neck a little bit. Well, you know, or, well, I guess you don't. Kiva, the one with the lightning... And and the storms and they're not a, a a goddess per se, but well, folk around here believe that Kiva controls fate, death, things like that. And when you die at sea, as you would when you're a sailor like myself, she's the one that comes and gets you. This really isn't drugging anything. Why would it- I- <laughs> I'm from Asturia, no it isn't. Well, how'd you get the cape? That is a very long story. His confused demeanor shifts back into that cocky smirk, and he perches his chin on his hand and says, We've got nothing but time. Well, the long and short of it is- I've talked to the Stormbringer a couple times. 
His eyes get really big. You've talked to her. Yes. Again, long story. There was an incident with, with some portals and I was in the mountains and the cape was like calling to me and it was a whole thing. And now I just have it and also I've talked to her. And sometimes she sends me cloud messages, I guess. Well, I don't know who else would be sending me cloud messages. All right. You'll uh, have to forgive my skepticism, lass. It's just that I wasn't aware that there were any other powers in Australia at work other than your Lord of Bones, as it were. Not for a while, as far as I can tell. It seems the Stormbringer had a bit of a foothold and lost it quite a while ago. His eyes get even bigger. He slams both of his hands down on the table and says, What in the high holy fuck is going on here? I wish I knew. This man is having a full-blown crisis. He's not even trying to hide it. You can see him, like, trying to do math in his head and the equations just aren't coming up. Eventually, he blinks a few times very heavily, sits back in his chair. <sighs> All right. Well, I suppose questions of theology are so far to the back burner at this point that it's not even worth bringing any more of it up. And honestly, I don't know if my head could take it. What were you doing in Candlelight Wharf? Trying to get passage to Vogvoder, where we were separated from several close companions, including Sabine. I'm, I'm still a little bit hung up on the Sabine issue. You'll have to give me a moment. Under his breath, he mumbles, you and me both. That's not helping. And this would take much longer to explain. We were sent to Oskaya from Gimtarum rather suddenly. And we have been trying to make our way back for a few months at this point. The crisis is deepening. It's not so much that you can see the wheels in this guy's head turning as it is that you can hear them grinding together and smell a little bit of the smoke coming out. But eventually he regains some air of authority and clasps his hands together on the table in front of him, eats another spinach puff a little dejectedly, and says, Well, I'm afraid I've got some unfortunate news for you, lass. Even if I were inclined to help you, which I still might not be, there's a bit of an obstacle to that objective in front of you. We cut back to Leo, who has lost a shirt and both shoes at this point. Leo, as promised, Boots is handing your ass to you. I'm just sitting there holding my cards, attempting to uphold some semblance of decorum. Roll performance. Six. It's cold in the brag, man. You're doing your best. It's not great. And also the bird is, like, staring you down. Pelican is not. The bird is. <laughs> well, boys, you beat me at one more hand, it's about to get a lot more risque, so what do we say we raise the stakes? My good man, you have nothing to raise. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment, from behind Boots and Pelican, somebody yells, for fuck's sake, you two! You see at the bottom of the stairs an older Stormfolk woman with, like, pretty short jaw-length silver hair and eye patch, and dressed in, like, a very modest and kind of prim way. And the last of the pirates that brought you back to the boat, this gangly, like, the equivalent of, like, 15-year-old teenage boy who is, like, peeking around this older woman. And she says, it's none of my business what you get up to in your own time, but I would think the two of you could keep a little bit of decorum when you knew the boy was going to be down here. Leo very demurely tries to cover the top half of his torso with his hands and the hand of cards that he has. Boots says, Doc, to be fair, he did challenge us. Letting him win would hardly have been sporting of me. 
And also, they did say that all I had to lose was the shirt off my back and my dignity, and I have lost both, plus my shoes. This older Stormfolk lady, uh, Doc, apparently, shakes her head in deep disappointment and says, Give the man back his shirt. I mean, I wouldn't say no to getting my shirt back. Quite a lot of money went into me being able to not wear a shirt, but it is a kind of cold down here. Completely blowing past this, the teenager behind Doc scoots around her, and you see that he is holding the biggest, ugliest orange cat you have ever seen in your life. How big and how ugly, because I've seen a big, ugly cat, and I've got the scar to prove it. This cat is probably 25 pounds. (laughs) Orange as anything, just bright orange. (laughs) And... As it turns its head, you see that it has a face like a cartoon character that just ran into a wall. It is totally just smushed. (laughs) It's missing, like, most of one ear. It is a delightfully hideous creature. (laughs) And (laughs) this little teenager says, This is notice of delinquent repayment. Ah, you have to feed him, or we will all sink to the bottom of the sea and die. The, uh... I mean, first of all, sure. Second of all, the cat's name is Notice of Delinquent Repayment? In unison, all three of the Stormfolk in the room and Pelican's bird say, yes. Leo squints and then points at the teenager and goes, let me guess, your name is what? Like, Glasses? This teenager gives you a slow, suspicious look and says, Yes. Of course it is! All right, bring me the cat. He brings you the cat, hands you a little piece of some kind of bird through the bars of your cell, and I think just holds the cat up to the bars. Leo looks down at the bit of raw poultry in his hand and goes, Hey Pelican, how do you feel about this, man? The bird (laughs) gives you a long look. It, like, presses a wing to its chest. (laughs) Like the tip of a wing. (laughs) And says, speaking only for myself, I once swallowed a seagull whole. Uh, 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 understandable. We all do what we have to do. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. And Leo holds out the piece of meat. Roll animal handling with disadvantage. Disadvantage? Cat's mean. (laughs) Okay, the cat's mean. And Leo's not a cat person. That's fair. Oh, I rolled a nat 20. That's so sad. But even with disadvantage, that's a 22. Okay. The cat does take the meat from your hand, and instead of going full Rambo on you, only scratches your arm a little bit. Leo winces a little bit and goes, All right. Thank you, notice of delinquent repayment. It appears we have an understanding. Glasses says, We're starting to think he has the taste for blood. Yeah, certainly would appear so. I guess you all are my company for the next little bit. Hello, Laryl. Nice to meet you. Doc says, I'm mostly down here for this, and then bustles over and just grabs your arm and pulls it out through the bars and just starts wrapping it in bandages. (laughs) Oh my god, thank you. That's so nice. You're the first nice person I've met here. Everybody else in the room laughs, and Doc gives them all sharp looks. And then turns back to you and says, We have a policy of non-harm to prisoners. The cat just doesn't abide by the law. Well, I certainly appreciate that policy, whether or not notice of delinquent repayment wants to abide by it. Boots and Pelican hurt my dignity a little bit, but I assume that that doesn't fall under the policy. I think she does reach in through the bars and just, like, pats you on the cheek a couple times and says, Boyo. The law doesn't apply to your own stupidity. As I am swiftly learning, I'm guessing that I'm not going to get a card game out of this particular watch. I'm too old to gamble on the boys too young. And she grabs your shirt from Boots and hands it to you. Fair enough. Besides, the only thing I have left to gamble is my shirt, and I just got that back. So I guess we'll all just be getting to know each other for the next little bit. Boots claps his hand. He is still holding onto your shoes. He has not returned them. And he says, well, we'd best be off to bed. 
Doc settles down in a chair and, and just like pulls a book out from nowhere and just starts paging through it. Leo hurriedly puts his shirt back on and then sits back down on whatever stool or bunk he has availability to do so with, looks at Doc and Glasses, and asks, So, um, policy of non-harm to prisoners. It would greatly put my mind at ease if one or both of you could confirm that that also extends to my sister, because a very well-dressed gentleman came down here quite a bit earlier to collect her, and I haven't heard from her since. Doc says, that'd be Ascot. A fucking course his name is Ascot. All right. She raises her eyebrows at you. She says, I wouldn't worry too much about him. He's... how to say this? If the man gets too close to the kitchen noise, he uh, looks like he's about to faint. That is a mild comfort over a long stretch of not even having that, I suppose. But this whole situation does beg the question of what all of you have to gain from kidnapping a couple of nobodies from a bar in Candlelight Wharf. Doc very deliberately turns a page in her book and says, Now don't sell yourself short, lad. I wouldn't exactly call the Grand Duchess and Duke of Shraria nobodies. Fuck. Doc humps to herself and just goes back to her book. Glasses sits down with the cat, and you sit in awkward silence for a minute. And then you hear footsteps on the stairs. <sighs> Pelican, if you're coming back from my shirt, have you not taken enough from me? Sophie gets to the bottom of the stairs. There's a brief second where she looks panicked, and then she stops and she squints at you and she says, Someone took your shirt? Yes, a gentleman who I engaged in an ill-fated game of cards with. It's really nice to see you alive, by the way. Uh, yes, you too. We have bigger problems. Behind her, you see a slightly older than you, but not by much, Stormfolk dude, fiery red hair, with a tricorn hat on. And he says, So, we should talk. And then we cut to the captain's quarters. Leo, you are sitting by a table upon which the captain, as he has introduced himself, unrolls a big map. He gestures at a line that's been marked out in the sea between Australia and Volgladur. And he says, The blockade's set up right here. They haven't declared war yet, but we can all pretty well see it on the horizon. Leo's eyes narrow as he stares down at the map. What reason do they have? Australia and Vauxvaldur have had a peace treaty for over the last century. There's no precedent for this. The captain grimaces. Aye, well, there may be no precedent, but... There isn't exactly need of one when, and he gestures at Fee, the Grand Duchess is presumed dead on Voldoran soil. Leo goes quiet for a very long stretch of time, and his eyes go very big. He presses both of his palms down on the map table and looks down at the parchment. <sighs> this is exactly what the old man's been wanting this entire time. Fee is, like, pinching the bridge of her nose. She says, I know Father has his faults, but he did end the last war, so... Ended it on his terms, which is the operative phrase here, Fee. I... I did a little digging while we were in Gimtarum, and it turns out that the Valdaran Wars could have ended decades before they did. But the old man didn't want to capitulate to Valdoran demands, so he skewed the political arena, engaged in some suspect activity, knifed good old Uncle Val in his bed. There's a lot that went on. There is a long pause, and Fee puts a hand over her mouth and just says, And I just became his newest excuse. I feel like I'm going to be sick. Well, if it's any comfort, he's never needed much of one. 
He wanted revenge, and this is how he gets it. Fee stands up from her own chair, just like hands up. I I need to take a walk. I and then she starts to go for the door, and the captain says, "Wait there." He looks at her, looks at you. He says, "As much as I'm up for a bit of shit talking, philosophizing about the reasons that aristocrats do things, has never been productive, to my knowledge." And he gives Fee like an attempt at a charming smile. As pretty as you are, I've got about a dozen good reasons to hand the two of you over to the Asharian Navy, get the blockade disbanded, and guarantee that none of this spills over into my islands. And precisely zero to help either of you get back to Vogelder. Leo grits his teeth super hard. We know where all of your missing people have been going. And to a degree, who has been taking them. And both of us want to make that stop. Roll insight. 20 fucking four, buddy. You watch a couple of emotions cross the captain's face in quick succession. For a second, he looks worried and then angry. And then you watch him, like, visibly calm himself down. And he says, Lad, people go missing at sea all the time. But disproportionately in the dragon's maw, yes? He whips his sword out and it is pointed at your throat in, like, a second. And he says, Right. I think the three of us had best start being honest with each other. You're getting all the honesty I have to give at this point. I'd hate to sound like I'm offering up excuses, but when both of us were still living in Australia, neither of us knew anything. It was all kept under wraps, it was all obfuscated, blamed on Stormfolk pirates or other outside forces. But the reality, which I'm sure you can corroborate, is that sometimes folks in the Dragon's Maw just disappear. And maybe sometimes those folks disappear close to Australian ships, and people who are taken to Luxtogallan never come back. We see that now, we know that now, and we want to make sure it never happens again. And that's why you should help us. Almost quicker than you can process, the captain puts his sword back in the sheath, stretches his shoulders. And he says, right, well, and then he like dusts his hands off. Bit of a problem with that. I am, and he makes a grand gesture, the highest authority in the fleet. But there are other forces at play that I am accountable to. So we'll have to do a bit of fancy negotiation. Well, it will please everyone here to know that I am very skilled at fancy negotiation. Just explain the terms to me. There's a bit of a system of checks and balances for myself and most other pirates in the area. You understand? I am accountable to... And then he pulls out another piece of paper, and it's a map of a little island. The other pirate monarchs of Tordun, Australia, Vogelder, Oskaya, Dowder. And we have a bit of an agreement that none of us is going to interfere in the blockade. So we can't get back to Vogelder until that particular agreement is dissolved. Yes? He gives you this sideways grin. And then he points at this smaller map that he's pulled out, and he says, This is Parley Kouf. I can call a meeting between myself and the other pirate monarchs pretty easily. And he hooks his thumb around one of the chains around his neck and pulls out of his shirt a, uh, looks like a little globe made of ruby. And he rubs his thumb over it in a way that looks deliberate, and it starts to glow. The trouble is going to be convincing them. The Pirate Queen of Asharia especially is a piece of work. Didn't even know that that was a person that existed until right now. Well, you're a lucky man. 
I'm not exactly eager to see her this soon after the last time we talked. But needs must, I suppose. Okay, so Parley Cove, we figure out what's going on there. In the meantime, could we maybe not be in the brig? It's really cold down there, and the food's not awesome. Fee says, yeah, I would love a real bed. It's been a while. The captain looks up at her and smirks and says, I could provide that. And then he looks back at Leo and says, the two of you can stay in the crew's quarters. You'll have to put up with Ascot snoring, but... Sir, you had me at bed. He nods, he says, right, seems we have an agreement. And then he sticks out his hand. Yeah, I'm gonna shake it. Fee, the captain leads you below deck, down to where the crew's quarters are. It's a big, wide open space, subdivided into several smaller, almost cubicles, that are housing the crew of this ship, which is pretty sizable given how big it is. You and Leo are led to one of these open berths. It has a set of bunk beds in it. Leo quickly claims the top one. And he wasn't kidding about Ascot, the young man that got you out of the brig in the first place, having a little bit of trance apnea. (laughs) (laughs) It's loud, but Leo is very tired and goes into his trance almost immediately. What are you doing? I think I'm going to go up on deck. You walk out on deck. It is the dark of the night. The stars are out, reflecting off the water. And above you, you see a shadow cast down onto the deck from up in the rigging. You look up and the really tall, skinny guy with the infernal bird that you saw in the bar is, like, crouched on all fours in the rigging, and he and the bird are just watching you. Please don't. The bird ruffles its feathers in an offended manner. Young lady, it would be a dereliction of my duty if I were to abandon Nightwatch. And then from behind you, you hear, Pelican, you daft ghost of a man! Nightwatch doesn't mean night lurk! Piss off! The bird harumphs, and then Pelican hops down out of the rigging and walks off across the deck and disappears. The captain is standing behind you, smirking. Thanks for that. Don't mind Pelican, he's mostly harmless. It's the bird you want to watch out for. Oh, Pelican's the- I thought Pelican was the bird. It's a bit of a complicated situation, lass. At any rate, you're out awful late. Everything all right down in the crew's quarters? Uh, fine. I just needed some air. Well, you're in the right place for that. I am glad to see you, though. I, it strikes me that I forgot to return some of your effects to you earlier. He reaches into his frock coat, which he has put back on, and produces your wand and your orb, and holds them out to you. I reckon since we're working together, at least for now, it'd do well to have you armed. Fee, as politely as she can, snatches back her wand and her orb, tucks the wand back in its holster, and holds the orb by her side and says, I appreciate that, and... If we're working together, now seems to be the time to tell you that I'm always armed. His eyebrows raise a little bit, and he breaks out into a wide, sharp-toothed grin, and says, Well, I'll take that as good news. If you aren't able to tell, I like to keep company that's both beautiful and dangerous. He tips his hat, nods. Good night to you, lass and walks off across the deck into the shadows. Fia bites down on the inside of her cheek for a second, sucks a breath in through her teeth and says, well, interesting. And I think kind of looks out over the ocean, trying to see what the weather looks like out there. So it's a crystal clear night. 
But the longer you look over the deck and as the ship moves through the water, gently rocking, out just barely over the horizon, you can see this really weird weather effect happening. It's almost an aurora effect in that the sky is lighting up and shifting back and forth between dark greens and purples and grays and deep blues. And distantly, far, far across the water, almost inaudible under the sound of the waves, you do hear a little bit of thunder. Looking out over the sea, Fee, almost to herself, just quietly nods, says, Kiva, huh? You're still holding the orb? Yes. It lights up in your hand with a speed and intensity that makes you jump. You look down and this previously kind of muted, shifting, looking glass orb is crackling with live electricity in your palm. The longer you watch it, it almost looks like the electricity is breathing, slowly growing and shrinking in intensity. It's like something's in there. Fee, like, turns it over between her hands for a second, and then takes another deep breath, says, Can I trust him? This is not a conversation. You don't hear anything. You have heard the Stormbringer, Kiva's voice before. You've talked to them. That's not what this is. But the longer you are holding this orb and rolling it back and forth between your hands as it lives and breathes with this electricity, you start to feel it answer you. You ask this question, can I trust him? And the orb doesn't answer you, but you feel a sense of reassurance and calm wash over you. Just a rush of emotion that feels right. He's gonna stick the orb in her pocket and then start to head back inside. The orb shocks you <laughs> when you put it down. It just kind of zaps your hand really quick. It doesn't hurt that much. But you feel that same kind of static shock in the root of your palm that you have been feeling in the last several encounters that you have had with this entity. And you feel like your mojo just got a little bit more juice. So you have now leveled up to a level 9 Divine Soul Sorcerer. Fab fully drops the orb into her pocket, goes, Ow, shit! And then I think, like, whips around to look at the ocean <laughs> in outrage. You whip around, and over the railing on the side of the ship, you see these dark rolling waves reflecting the night sky overhead, reflecting this strange aurora weather effect you've never seen before. Off in the distance, within the depths of this weather effect, lightning flashes cloud to cloud, briefly lighting up the sky and the sea around it. And standing on the surface of the water, you see a lithe figure wrapped in a stormy cloak with no visible face, but out of the darkness... There are two glowing, crackling blue eyes, and a smile like a lightning bolt. The figure raises their arm as if to wave. A huge wave rolls up, crests, and crashes down. And when it hits the water again, there is nothing. And that's where we're going to end for this week. Oh, all right. <laughs> when we told you guys there were going to be pirates. 
man, you don't even know the half of it yet. But we'll find that out next time. On Capel Duel. Hey everybody, Barry here with the postscript, just clearing up a couple housekeeping things here at the end of the episode. You can find us on social media, on Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok, at Compelled Duel. You can also find us on TikTok, at Compelled Duel Audios, where we post audio snippets for the show. We have lots of other cool stuff, like an official Spotify profile, an official website. You can find all of that linked on our various social media channels. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, we ask that you consider heading over to patreon.com slash compelled duel, where for just $2 a month, you can get signed up for really cool perks, including early access to episodes, access to bonus content, and even letters from your favorite character every month. If you'd like to support the podcast in ways other than pledging to our Patreon, we ask that if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, that you consider leaving us a rating and a review. That's going to help the show get promoted to a wider audience and help us grow our listener base. And as always, if you like the show, word of mouth advertising is the best possible thing for us in the whole entire world. So if you're enjoying what you're hearing, just tell three friends about it. And if they like it too, ask them to tell three friends as well. Episode 7 is going to be premiering on Friday, July 23rd, 2021. Or if you are a member of our Patreon, you will get your early access to that on Thursday, July 22nd. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you all next